Welcome to the Soccer Geeks Podcast, hosted by Jason Barbato. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Soccer Geeks Podcast. I am your host, Jason Barbato, and with me as always, the show's most excellent producer, Marissa Kelly. Marissa, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you for uh, all those, uh, the accolades of uh, me being the producer of this and obviously, you know, coming up with new um, adjectives that you can describe. I me. try. So I, I try. It. They're always positive, <laughs> always positive, always uplifting. I always try to lift you up, my friend. Um, yes. uh, great to have you on the show today. Anything you want to yes. say with us before we, I introduce our guest? No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to talk to our guest today. Um, you know, being from San Diego, always hearing about this gentleman and how he's like soccer royalty in, yeah. <laughs> I mean, another soccer, soccer royalty person. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who we have on today? You know, we're going to talk about carving a different path and for like talking about swords that are forged in the hottest fires of the game. And uh, we're really privileged today to talk about uh, and talk to Craig Childs. And one of the things I'm so excited uh, about that and why I use the the uh, symbolism there of talking about carving is because if there were a Mount Rushmore of arena soccer oh. in the United States, one man's mm -hmm. just chiseled jawline would, would rest <laughs> upon said mountain. And that is the one and only Craig Childs. So let's go ahead and welcome okay. said jawline to our show. Craig, how you doing? Yes. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, you gotta get the, you know gotta my, shave just yeah. the under here and then we it's really distinct as when you get to our that's right. right. I was tight. Craig, welcome to the show. A little bit. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> yeah, man. Super excited to talk about to you today. Uh talk about you today and talk with you today. Uh Marissa, any parting th shots or thoughts? No, I'll be back at the end to give some uh quick recaps and looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Craig. There's a lot of different avenues that we could go, and there's a lot of different – you got your fingers in a lot of pies in the game of soccer in our country. And what I'd love to be able to do today is kind of thread uh, the needle of kind of you finding your way in the game in your own way. Um, and I, it kind of all starts back, obviously, with you being a youth player here in San Diego. And, and Marissa talked that you're a local legend. You, you're not only like a local legend, you're like a national icon, but it's not in the, 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 it's not in the outdoor game. It's, it's the, it's, and I don't want to just call it indoor game, but it's the indoor, it's the arena game. You, you are an icon. And I think what's, what's really great, um, of kind of hearing part of your story is kind of going back and seeing that thread all the way through, like where, where you found your footing. Uh, can you take us a little bit back to, you know, you still live in your hometown that you grew up in Poway, California. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about some of your youth playing days, um, what that was like? And then as you kind of entered into like San Diego state and playing, playing locally here at, at the, the local uh, state university, can you, can you talk about that a little bit for us? Yeah, I, I was born and raised in uh, in Poway, San Diego, and and um, through my youth playing career, you know, I was fortunate enough to to participate in San Diego soccer's camps locally um, in, in Poway. And Brian Quinn at the time was the was the director of the Poway Vaqueros, and and at one point when I was younger, was one of my coaches. So. Okay. You know, growing up, I knew a lot about the soccers. I knew that there was this relationship that Brian Quinn had coaching Poway Vaqueros at the time. And, and he was also the, the San Diego soccer's head coach. And so, you know, we would be out at Hillary Park with Quinny and then we would catch a game on on Saturday evening, you know, and he would be coaching that first team. And, and uh, you know, we, we drew a lot of inspiration from that as youth players locally. And it gave us... Um, you know, it let our imagination run that that there was a possibility to play professional soccer and that uh, and that, you know, if, if we enjoyed the sport enough and pushed ourselves hard enough, there was a um, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And so um, I, I played for Pauly Vaqueros until I was 14 locally right down um, the street. I, I really enjoyed myself. I found a love for the game there. And, and at 15 years old, um, my brother and myself made the jump to nomads, uh, who at the okay. time were, you know, the local men's powerhouse or, or, yep. or boys powerhouse surf had a really dominant female program at the time. And their male program 
was solid. Um, but Nomads was definitely the cream of the crop back in the day when, when I was growing up and, uh, I, I played for David Armstrong, okay. um, for multiple years. And, and, you know, it, anybody who's played in that club knows, you know, if you play for the Nomads and you're doing well, Derek will, will be popping in there as well. And so, you know, I, I had David, Derek, Quinny, um, a lot of very high end coaches locally, uh, that really helped me in my developmental process to, uh, to get to where I am now. And so, you know, I went from Pali Vaqueros to Nomads and, and played, uh, um, high school soccer as well back mm -hmm. then. And, and, uh, really enjoyed my time, um, at Poway high school and, you know, w was lucky enough my junior and senior year to, uh, to be able to make the jump to San Diego state. And, and truthfully, academically, I, I didn't have the best freshman year and, and really struggled in high school. Yeah. Um, and that, that was a, a wake up call and a learning curve for me that, you know, if I really wanted to push to get at the next level, then my education and grades were going to be just as important as my ability to play. And so mm -hmm. I can, I can remember my junior and senior year, you know, taking a couple phone calls from, from big time universities and a light bulb went off in my brain that was like, Holy cow, I'm, I'm either going to go to college and play soccer or I'm going to enter the workforce as an 18 year old. And I had a lot of friends at the time that were entering the military because of nine 11, um, which happened in my high school um, time. And so it was kind of like, you know, I had this, this epiphany or light bulb moment when I was speaking to these coaches on the phone that, you know, I, I was, uh, I didn't want to go in the military at the time. I was, you know, quite frankly, scared. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to get a job, you know, and, and, and I thought, dude, I, I had a really good platform to push myself to the next level. And, and uh, my junior and senior year in high school, I, I ended up taking classes at Palomar and Miracosta um, to make up some of the, the poor grades I had for my freshman year to, to be able to wiggle myself into um into san diego state and I, I look back on it now and i'm like you know w one or two tiny adjustments either direction in in my trajectory right. could have gone completely yeah. different you know one yeah. one bad weekend with the wrong friend or or whatever and and so you know you look back on it a uh, 14 year pro career and i'm just super thankful and blessed that everything worked out the way that it worked out and um you know, it's a journey. There's ups and downs uh, to everybody's journey. And um, nobody, you know, is born in, is born a pro and you've got to put the work in and you've got to put the effort in and, and you'll have some moments where you're down um, on yourself and you're down on your career and you're injured or something like that. And then you'll have moments where you're you're on the top of the totem pole. And so I, I've enjoyed the ride and um, I'm super thankful for all of the coaches that I've had throughout my career. I mean, honestly, it's 30 or 40 um, coaches and, and yeah. 25 of which I still see on a weekend basis, you know, at right. the fields. And so, you know, I, I feel really proud to be a San Diego native that represented the San Diego soccers that, you know, that quite frankly is going to end up in the rafters or in the history books. And, and you look at the, the history of the soccers in that program and, um, you know, at, at the time, it's a lot of foreigners, a lot of guys coming in from Europe, um, a lot of South and Central Americans in the 80s and 90s. And uh, you look at the rafters and there there's Polish players that played in the World Cup and Hungarian superstars from 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 Europe and, and Hugo Perez that that was transferred mm -hmm. from the soccers to Atletico Madrid to Real Madrid. And and it just shows you the the talent base in indoor soccer back in that day. But um but but what makes it special to me is that that I'm one of the few local kids that was developed here locally um, and, and, you know, had a successful enough career to uh, put myself in the same conversation pieces as Quinny and Julie V and, and Zoltan Toth and um, Kaz Dana and all the above. Yes. Huge names, huge names, not just, not just locally, but nationally, you know, as far as program goes. And I, and I want to get eventually to you know, the soccer's, you know, your, your days that are still there, like your days are, you're still there as well. But, and I want to get there. Um, but what I want to do is I want to kind of, I want to, I want you to kind of take uh, us down a little bit of kind of just the, the thought process and just the life 
uh, the life experience that you gained. You know, you you come out of SDSU, you play with some some really big time players as well, but you come out, uh, you're in, you, you know, you get drafted into the MLS uh, by Chivas USA. Um, you know, top ten pick, uh, kind of like right where Chivas is like at their height. You know, kind of before it pivots, and then we know, we know, you know, historically people know that that thing kind of knows that pretty hard. But you're kind of right there. Um, you sign it, you know, you sign here with the MLS, uh, you sign an MLS contract, but you're not there probably as long as you expect it to be. And, um, and things kind of shifted. Can you talk a little bit before, like, not, not so much like what happened just after there, but can you kind of talk a little bit about that time frame for you as a player? You know, you kind of went through like, you know, p- kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps ironing out some grades, the local JCs to kind of, to kind of pull your weight there, going through the experience at SDSU. And now you're, now you're a a full-time pro. What was that like for you? Yeah. You you know, Lev Kirshner had a lot of credit to do with me getting into some of these combines and, and uh, exposing myself to a lot of the, the MLS coaches. And, um, you know, I, I, I will always be thankful for, for what he's, uh, he's done for me. And, and you go from being, you know, one of the best players in the Pac-10 conference and, and a first-team all-league player and, you know, the leading points getter on your team to um, a rookie, you know, at a very veteran, veteran-based um, Chivas USA squad. I mean, and, and just look at the names that were in that locker room now. You've got Jesse Marsh, who's the current Leeds coach. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got Claudio Suarez, who they called the Emperor, who's an absolute Mexican legend, probably the biggest Mexican um, national team legend, maybe in, in the history of the game. You've got Rafael Vicky, who coached for Basel in the Champions League, mm-hmm. Sasha Kleschen, Brad Guzan, um, Zach Thornton, Jimmy Curtin. Jimmy Curtin's currently the Philadelphia Union coach. I mean, yeah. you can look through that locker room and there are yeah. – 10 the pedigrees everywhere. Yeah. Big, big, big time pros. And so, you know, I, I got into that. Ante Razov uh, is also there. And, and not to mention the person that actually drafted me and brought me in and, and offered me my first professional contract is, was Preki, um, w- which is a story in itself because yeah. he, he's an indoor soccer um, legend. And I can tell you about the exit meeting when we get there with him. Um but the truth is I got into that locker room and I knew I was going to have to fight and battle for playing time. And, and uh, nothing was given to me. I was there six weeks competing every single day on my own dollar, staying at my grandma's house um, with the right to earn that contract. And, and I watched 25 kids come and go. Um, and I knew I was, you know, battling it out for three or four contracts with another 10 or 15 people. And so it was a dog eat dog world. People didn't like each other in that room at times. And we knew that there was money on the line. And, and, um, and, and that's a little bit of the cruel world with the professional level, you know, is, is different than the college level where it's, it's your family and and everybody's really united as one. Um, and the pros is a dog eat dog world and, and it, it's a team game, but it's really in everybody's you know, the back of everybody's mind, it's about their contracts and what, yeah. what they need to do as a player to secure their next deal and a lot of that stuff. And, um, and so, you know, I have a decent first year. Um, the team has a little bit of injuries. I think I play in five or six MLS games. I play every single reserve game and, and uh, I play in the CONCACAF Champions League down in Panama in a couple games and playing the U.S. Open Cup up in Seattle in a couple games. And so, you know, I found myself getting on that field and, and um, gaining a lot of experience and, and enjoyed myself. Um, and, you know, the end of the year came. We made the playoffs. We fell short a little bit. It was a very uh, talented roster. And, and um, you know, I got brought in with Preki and, and Makovic and some of the other coaching staff to the end of the year exit meeting, which is super normal. And, and uh, you know, Preki candidly looks directly at me and he said, if I'm going to pick a 6 v 6 team to go play for a hundred K in a cash tournament, you know, you're one of the first three players I'd pick. (laughs) Yeah. But at this level, you know, you have to be mobile. You have to be fit. You have to be very athletic in particular in the MLS. And um, to be honest, I knew, I knew I just didn't have the athletic base that 75% of the players in that league had. And so um, I looked at him, you know, he, he gave me this spiel. Well, Minnesota Thunder, 
uh, has been calling about you. We would like to loan you out into Minnesota, into the NASL at the time. And we're going to monitor and track you and, and, uh, and we'll potentially bring you back in, um, you know, depending how the season goes for you there. And I kind of walked out of that exit meeting and, and the first person I called was, was Lev Kirshner. And I said, Lev, I have, I have three classes left to graduate. I know you're three weeks into the next semester. Um, can you call the AD and can, can you see if you can wiggle me into um, these classes? And he literally was like, just, just drive down from LA and, uh, and come back to state and, and we'll, we'll sort it out. And so, you know, I, I left that office. I packed up my stuff. I didn't really know if I was going to take anybody up on that USL or the mm -hmm. NASL deal at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, dude, I, I didn't really have a lot of faith that they were going to track me and bring me back. I thought it was right. an easy exit plan for them to get me out of their hair. Yeah, we'll and, call um, you. We'll let you know. We'll call yeah, you. That, yeah. That's that's yeah. how it went. And so, yeah. uh, you know, so I, I I ran back to San Diego State and I honestly, I, I walked into these three classes and I explained the situation that I'd been drafted and I left school a little early and I have three classes left to graduate. And all three teachers were like, dude, we're going to let you in, but you've got to make up the month's worth of work you missed. Yeah. And, you, you know, you obviously have to be a, a participating member of the class from here forward. And it was right. like, you got it. And so I, I did what I needed to do to, to jump in those three classes and crash them. And, and, um, and at the end of that semester, you know, I, I walked out of there with my college degree, which is something that, that I'm super proud of. And honestly, yeah. going back to school after participating in the MLS was, was not easy. And that is a challenge that, that I, I think a lot of people don't face, you know, it's like, it's easier to, to, just not go back and find a different job or find a coaching job. I didn't, I didn't need to have my college degree to be a director of coaching or executive director of a club. Um, but it was something that I put a lot of work into and I felt like I was so close to the finish line that it would make no sense for me to not, right. Um, to not finish. And, and as I'm training at San Diego state and crashing those three courses, you know, I get a call from some of my local buddies, also nomads guys, a little bit older than me at the time. And, and they were, you know, hey, there's a guy named Phil Salvaggio up north and he's going to bring back the soccers, you know, do you have any interest? And the funny thing was at that time I was playing at the water park mm -hmm. uh, or the water tower. Yeah. And I was also playing at uh, at Toby Wells and I was playing at uh, the Escondido Sportsplex or, or the Escondido uh, indoor complex. And I was paying 50 and 60 bucks to the manager i was a full participating member of three or four recreational indoor teams and um and i'm like dude get paid to play indoor instead of paying to play indoor like right. you got it you guys can you guys can count me in and uh yeah. you know and and from there that next that that end of that year the san diego soccers came back and, and it was a smooth transition for me right into uh the indoor game so well, who knew that Preki was also, you know, a little bit of a prophet. That's kind of funny uh, in that regard. I'm sure that's not something he has on his, his business card, but you know, for, you know, making that transition, right. You, you make it sound very seamless. Uh, like, Oh yeah, I kind of just did this and it was hard. Yeah. But I, I kind of found my way for, but genuinely like what was like mentally, like what, what, what mentally and like emotionally, like what was that? like for you as a player, because you had kind of, you kind of climbed those heights and now it's not like you had fallen. Right. But some, some, some structures around you got burnt to the ground, but yet you needed to, to, to still forge a path forward. And I'm just kind of curious, like what kept you going? Like what, what kept you tinkering like around the game? I mean, obviously there's like, yeah, the water towers still a huge thing in San Diego. There's still tons of pickup games. There's insane amounts of talent that are still down there. A lot of, I know that a lot of coaches go down there still to scout players and things like that. But, but I mean, where did you find that, that level of self-belief? Um, because there's a lot of people and a lot of stories, Craig, where people at that point just quit. They quit on themselves. Why didn't you quit on yourself like everybody else? You know, I, I really just love the game and a lot of my friends were, were surrounded around the game and uh, I knew that that I had a fair amount of talent and uh, I didn't want to waste waste the talent. And the truth was, um, you know, I, it, it never it never crossed my mind, which it, which is interesting now to look back on. And I know some players get burnt out and some players have a coach that 
rides them so hard. They lose the love for the game and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I played for really tough coaches that, that were very direct and very stern, <laughs> yes. uh, to, to, to say the least. And, um, for me, you know, I wasn't, it, it's all evolved a little bit. Now you have to be a little bit of a player's coach. Now you pat players on the back and, you, and you're positive. And at the, back in the day, it, it was a little bit more old school, a little more direct, a little more cutthroat. Um, and, you know, I, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I, I was um, helping to run an MCRD program down at the base. So I was already involved in running a, a rec program down there. When Mm -hmm. I'd come back to San Diego State, I was doing some private lessons and some small group lessons. I really didn't have any major desire to be involved in in team coaching at that time. It was more organization of how to run a rec league. And um, and I was putting some effort into making some players better. So I knew that my future was going to be in the game. Um, I also realized, which I think is an issue that a lot of players have, that – that I would be able to put my footprint down a little bit stronger if I was still playing and mm-hmm. trying to build my coaching career. And so yeah. a lot of players play and when they're done, they start coaching. Um, you know, I, I had a, I had an eight year overlap where I was coaching week in and week out on those fields and continuing to play like I still am, which I think is, is unique uh, and difficult to do in the USL and difficult and impossible to do in the MLS, quite frankly. Um, and so, you know, that's something that the indoor soccer league um, gave me the ability to do was like, OK, mm-hmm. I, I have enough time now to be able to um, build my coaching resume, educate myself as a coach, establish um, myself as a coach while using the marketing power of my ability to play. Um, and so, you know, I never, I never thought of backing out of the game. I never really thought, well, here's my time to quit. I just thought I'm either going to play pro or I'm going to play for fun, you know? And and that was my mentality. I was playing rec soccer, killing everybody at the water (laughs) tower. You know, I, I, I would, I would show up with, with, uh, three $5 bills and my player card. And I would wait at the next game and say, hey, I'll pay the refies if you let me on the roster. I'll pay the refies if you let me on the roster. And I would play five or six games a night. Um, And I became well-known down there. You know, people knew that I was going to come down there and freelance games. And people recognized me and knew who I was. And I would literally pay the refies and play back-to-back-to-back-to-back games. And uh and put my time in. Yeah, it, it was it was yeah. unbelievable. You're, hi- you're hired gun, like, dude. It's hilarious. Dude, it, it was unbelievable. I, it, it was crazy to think of now. And my buddy Mike Mercarelli spent a lot of time with me down there as well. And we loved it. I mean, we loved every minute of it. Sometimes you'd leave there and we'd blow a team out 15 nothing. Sometimes I'd have dads in my face telling me, why is the pro kid down here scoring so many goals? And I and I'd tell him, you know, I'm down here training, dude. And you can be on the field or you can get the hell off the field because <laughs> – I'm running you the show the down fees. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you pay the ref fees. And so, you know, uh, you, you look back on it and it's like, there is no substitute for time on the field. You know, you yeah. got to get on that field. You got to train. You got to train hard. You can have a genetic, you know, code. You can have an athletic ability. Um, but the intelligence, the understanding, the technical skill set, you know, that comes from putting effort into the game, whether you're watching right. or playing. And, uh, yeah. and those were – hundreds of hours on that indoor field that literally transferred right into the pro game when I made that jump. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that because, you know, you talked about the outdoor game and for you, like the conversation with Preki of like, you're not mobile enough. You're not athletic enough, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you're, you had the skill set that is just absolutely perfect for the indoor game. And yes, you honed that craft and, and, and you kind of found your footing there. But can you talk a little bit about why your skill set has been so successful at the indoor game? Like, what do you see your skill set as being? I mean, I have an idea what I think it is, but I'd love to hear what your take is. I think the yeah. record books show what your freaking <laughs> what your skill set is. But, but why was the arena game such a perfect fit for your set of skills? Yeah. You know, honestly, I, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't 
a dumb kid up in the MLS. I, I would walk out with Johnny Bornstein every day to training and and I would play right mid and he would play left back and he would tell me like, hey, dude, let's grab lunch today after practice. However, for the next hour and a half, I'm going to run you into oblivion. And I would look at him like, he's totally right. And there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. This kid <laughs> is going to just run me up and sure. down the channel all day, every day. And so, you know, while I'm training, I would play in the games. I would be put on corner kicks. I would play in the games, free kicks, direct at goal. I would take them, you know, over Sasha question, over elite level players. And, and it showed um, that my technique and my ability to strike the ball and my ability to serve uh, the ball w w was top notch. And so I lacked a little bit of mobility and to the ability to chase some of these players around. Um, but the truth was growing up and in college, I, I was a, uh, I, I was heavy on the soccer IQ side. I had very good technical skills and um, I had the ability to finish the ball. And so, you know, those are three things that, that separated me um, from the pack. And, and I knew I had to put a lot of time into, into my fitness, into running, into my athleticism, um, because I knew I had some certain, certain right. skill sets that were, um, you know, that, that were very hard to replicate. And so, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm probably one of the best one-time finishers uh, in indoor soccer and, and maybe the history of the game. I'm not the best player on the dribble. I'm not a double, triple scissor, cut in, cut left and shoot the ball kind of guy. Uh, but if my teammates find me, you know, in the crease, it, I don't need a touch. And, and basically I can adjust my technique to be able to hit that ball on frame. Um, and, and a, small, a, small, a smaller frame than the big net too, by the way, it's a much smaller frame with big body standing in front of it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. And, and, and honestly, growing up in college and, uh, in youth soccer and MLS, I, I was a midfielder. And so it took me a little bit of time to adjust to playing target forward, um, in the indoor game, but you know, soccer is soccer and, and, um, making good passes is, is important and, and putting the ball on target is the same in indoor and outdoor. And it takes a little bit of time to figure out the boards and, and the little nuances of the game substitutions and stuff like that. But the truth is, you know, every single youth player up here plays hundreds of hours of four V four, five V five, six V six. And there's no difference to what we're doing right. out there. It's sharp, short motions. You, you play, you play a pass, you make a dynamic run, you cycle back through and, and you repeat. And so um, I would think my, my soccer IQ, my vision, my technical skill set and technique in terms of finishing um, are the main attributes that, that translated very well um, into indoor soccer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's been a huge, you know, I think a lot of coaches now see the indoor uh, environment as actually being really uh, helpful to developing more technical players. The speed of play, uh, it's a little cagey. You know, it's an that's a you know a knife fight in a phone booth with a soccer ball thrown at everyone's feet. Like it's very cagey, but the intensity is really high. But it's kind of shorter, shorter lived intensity because of the line changes and things like that. So I always just think it's it's really interesting to note that the three things that you said that are so vital. I mean, th those things are really vital for the outdoor game as well, but they translated so much easier for you, quote unquote, you know, in, in honing this. And I, and I, I, I want to ask the question, you know, do you feel, do you feel that from a player standpoint, growing up with the skill set that you had, like if you were a youth player today, what do you think, do you think that the MLS pathway still like that, that there's a broader now scope of the type of player that can be caught under the, the, the growth of the game in the country, the MLSs, the USLs, even, you know, even NISAs, things like that. Or, or do you think that there'd have been less of an opportunity for a player like you, if you were coming up right now? That's a tricky question because, you know, I have a lot of people, for example, if I would have come back from Chivas USA and the Loyals would have been around in 2009, I 100% would have dominated the USL at that time. I was yeah. I was a very, very good outdoor player. Um, there were just no options for me to play outdoor yeah. unless I wanted to move out of the city of San Diego. And I had yeah. a long-term girlfriend from high school who's now my wife. And, and uh, you know, we had made the decision that that we were going to stay in San Diego where all of our family is. And, and um 
And because of that, I'm like, cool, dude, I'll play for the one team that pays money, you know, and that's the San Diego Sockers. And I'm going to go pro and I'm going to stay local. And the truth is probably my third year in the league, I, I had I had picked up my second league MVP and I got a call from New England Revolution that was referred by by a, a local friend around here and was like, dude, you know, we want to invite you into preseason camp. We're going to send you a plane ticket. And um, it didn't pan out. You know, they, they kind of big league me. Yeah, your plane tickets for tomorrow. I said, absolutely not. You know, I, I, I've got to fulfill my playoff commitment for the soccer yeah. and I'll jump on a plane in a week and a half. And this right. will give me time. And, and I told them, and by the way, I'm indoor fit. I'm not outdoor fit. I need to put some miles on my legs too, you know. And and uh, from there, that that fizzled out very, very quickly, right? And, and um, now there's a lot of different platforms uh, or pathways for players to yeah. make that jump. You're right. You've got Nisa that owns the rights of those players and are really developing a lot of youth players to potentially look at, at, at selling them and making a little bit of money. You've got the NPSL. Um, which was also around in a league I participated in. In, mm-hmm. in 2006, I won the MPSL National Championship with the San Diego Fusion, um, which was a really big deal at the time and, and still is a very solid uh, league. And, and now you've got USL being a well-established league from coast to coast and, and the MLS as, um, as that top tier. And so I do think it's harder now to get into the MLS as a collegiate player um, than it was. You know, you, they're looking at South American, Central American talent that's yeah. 18, 19 years old. And some of these kids are absolute barn burners. And and on the flip side of that, and I tell my U19 players this all the time, that it, it's harder to get into the college game now than it was back then, too. Yeah, yeah for sure. Look at Marshall. Marshall and some of the other teams competing for the national championship. I think Marshall had one American player. Right. Their central midfield three was like a Brazilian, a Spaniard, and a, and a Mexican player that were all internationals. And it was like, holy cow, guys, you're not just competing with the local talent. You know, it is a, a D1 positions are global positions nowadays where they're looking at Swedish players. They're looking at Germans. Scandinavians are coming in. Spanish, Brazilian players are coming in to play Division One and get educated. And so... You know, the landscape has evolved and changed. Um, the MLS caliber has gone up. The Division One caliber has gone up. Um, and it's squeezing out some of the, the American club players that may have been able to wiggle in um, to uh, those divisions in the past. But on the flip side of that, you know, there are other avenues that weren't in existence back in that day with NISA and USL and some of that other stuff too. So it, it's a double-edged sword. It's harder to get in to some of those top quality programs, but um, uh, there's more programs available to get into. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the future is bright for youth soccer in Southern California. And, um, and you know, you, you look at some of these players and there's, there's U17, 18 players training right now with the Loyals Academy on youth contracts. And, and some of these kids have realized, you know, that, that, they're going to try to take the professional pathway and, and they're going to opt out of a potential collegiate pathway, um, which was very difficult to do in early two thousands when I was coming. Right. It was um, the, one of, of the college. only path. It was one of the only pathways. It really yep. was, you know, and then no, you've got the Freddie, Freddie Adus, which was kind of the anomaly, but that also, that also sank a Titanic for a lot of kids uh, and a lot of that pathway being a viable option because MLS clubs weren't making a lot of money back then. And, you know, Freddie Adu, you know, to not, not much to his own personal, you know, um, choices and stuff like that, but just part of being part of the ecosystem, it, it burned yeah. a lot of bridges and created a lack of opportunity and a lot of fear in the marketplace. That's just my, my opinion. I, I, of it. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, that's, it's nice to know that I'm, I'm in good company. <laughs> hey, um, yeah. so we could talk about the growth of the MASL. We could talk about, you know, the, the need for that product to be in more, not just secondary cities, but more big cities in the country. Um, that, that I feel is like a whole other kind of podcast that we could really do on the growth of that there. What I'd like to pivot into as you've been kind of breadcrumbing uh, through the conversation and kind of talking about um, seeding your future and tilling that soil through, while your playing career was still happening, you were still participating in the game. You were, you were, you were kind of earning your chops as a coach. You were, you were um, volunteering time at MCRD, as you said. Um, that's like the recruiting depot down here. That's for a lot of military families and, and military players and things like that. Um, 
for those of you that don't live down here in San Diego. Um, but I want to kind of talk about, um, I want to talk to your role now as like the director of coaching for the Cardiff Soccers, which is, you know, as you've said in conversations with me, it's a community based club. Uh, you came from the Vaqueros, pretty, pretty notable sized, you know, rep, very reputable club in San Diego County. You know, you and I could list, you know, the top 10 of like, these are the biggest clubs. You, you're a big name in San Diego it locally, like it just, and even, you know, with the MASL, but you could have gone a lot of different places um, and be very ego driven of like, I'm, listen, I'm, I kind of am a big deal around here. I'm just going to take a nice high profile job and kind of, kind of phone it in a little bit, but you didn't, um, you're kind of, you're kind of overflowing that work ethic. I think you've, you've always shown and had into now like this, this isn't just a passion project. Like you genuinely care. So I, I, I throw all that out to say, um, I would love to hear about your, your approach and your philosophy as the director of coaching now at the Cardiff Soccers and like what that means to you. Yeah. You know, it, it was funny because, uh, when I took over Cardiff or when I was invited into Cardiff, there was a fan and, and I, his son just played his last uh, game for me as a senior at Man City Cup yesterday. And uh, this fan came up to me, you know, during the soccer game when I was on the bench and said, Hey, it's my son's birthday. Can you give me a ball? And we were like, dude, how are you down here? Security, get this guy <laughs> out of here. And then he followed up with an email and was like, Hey, I'm the guy that approached you for the ball. Thank you for giving my son a ball. Um, for his birthday, I'm one of the board members of, of a rec program in Cardiff, and we'd like to bring you out for a clinic. And I, you know, I kind of shied him away a couple times. Sure. And then, and then I got out there and I, I ran a clinic for the rec program. And I kind of started looking around and there was this brand new field being established over on the west side of the five Encinitas Community Park. And there were no professional coaches in the club. There were three or four um competitive teams and there was a rec program of about 250 kids or so and I kind of started to put it all together and I'm like dude this is a fantastic area in the city um there's a lot of really smart people on this board that are super intelligent and looking out for the for the true betterment of these kids and uh and I I grabbed two I grabbed the two teams and I brought my buddy Ray Ray's in also from yep. the soccer's and and the two of us took the four teams and organically, you know, we've now grown this club into 30 plus teams. And, and um, we have a lot of community based kids. We have a lot of, of um, players that roll out of their school and jump onto the field and participate in their practice. I think we are in the high seventies uh, in terms of our ratio of, of Encinitas and Cardiff kids in our club, which is astronomically high compared to, a majority of club. And so we really yeah. do serve the community and, and as the club has evolved, you know, we've been able to establish some extremely competitive teams um, as well as our community based teams, you know, and, and, and it's not an easy thing to do because of uh, the leagues and, and the hierarchy of the, the league system. And, and so we have to be better coaches. We have to be more invested in the players. We have to care more about the community and what's going on because we don't have a league to fall back on. You know, if, if I'm in the ECNL or the MLS next and, and uh, there's a line of 300 kids waiting for your spot, if we have an issue where in Cardiff, you know, you, you take what you get and you work with what you get and you make what you have better. Um, and you do, Oh, you mean actually to... coach? That's, that's weird. Yeah. Tell me, tell me yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we, we really focus on on the development of each kid. We understand that some kids need to be pushed harder than others. And, and we have some teams that won the MPL this year. And we have other teams that that played in double AC bracket. And, and um, you know, as a director, I'm at each of their trainings equally. I like to go to the, the girls 2013 second team games as much as I like to go to the 04 top team games. And and um you know, you just get around those fields and those kids enjoy seeing you got you out there. Yeah. They enjoy be, seeing you on the field and having that relationship with you and then getting to see you in the arena on Saturday night and be like, dude, that's my coach. And and uh, he was out at the clinic last night and he told me yesterday that was a really good penalty kick. And, you know, those little things go a long way for some of those players. Yeah. And, and those are all um, memories that coaches gave to me. And and 
you know, I try to be as positive as possible with the, the club players. I, I am a little bit stricter as a club coach for my team. You know, I have a high, a high standard and I set a, a high bar. And as the executive director of the club, I feel like my two teams should be um, the poster boy teams yeah. of the group. Right. And it's like, dude, what? We're not complaining to the refs. We're not, we're not talking to parents on the sideline. We're not disorganized and having our bags chaotic, you know, like we set the standard for the rest of the club. And, and if you're not cool with those expectations, then, uh, you know, then, then we're not going to see eye to eye very long, yeah. you know, and so Love Kirshner, your way out of here. Yes. <laughs> that, that is, that's right. And, and, uh, I found yeah. a balance between being new school and, and old school, yeah. but you know, the, the truth is, um, I look for coaches that are positive, that are encouraging, that want to be out on that field and want to be with those kids and are good teachers of the game more than I look for a coach with experience or a high level coaching license or, or any of that stuff. And so I've, I've really been able to build the club based on good coaching and coaches that, that are, that are positive and encouraging of those players. And, a coach that sits on his chair and, and yells from the sideline, you know, it isn't my cup of tea and not someone I'll, I'll look to bring in regardless of yeah. a license state cup winner, this, that, and the other. And, and, uh, and so, you know, that's a little bit of the philosophy of the club. And, and I can tell you the Cardiff board has been nothing but supportive and has given me the reins and support to guide this club in the direction that I see fit. And, um, you know, I'm really thankful for that. And, and I'll always be cherish, you know, the beginning memories of Cardiff Mustangs and the evolution into the Cardiff Soccers and 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 the support that I've had from countless board members um, that, quite frankly, are all volunteers. And so, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons as well. None of them. um get a get a, a break on club fees. None of them get paid. They're all there to serve the betterment of the kids they're all there to make the community club a as um successfully operated as possible and and it just shows you that everybody's united in the in the same direction um and in every conversation is really you know what's best for the kids and and not just the best players what's best for every one of our kids you yeah. know do do we want our community-based kids in this league um, even if it's best for our best teams, you know, we've got to look out for from the top down. And, and, um, and that's what we do a good job of, I believe. And uh, yeah, and, and we found our niche and I, I really enjoy it. And I don't think we'll be an ECNL or an MLS club ever. Um, and that's okay, you know, because we'll get our good players and we'll find an avenue to get kids to college and get them exposure. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if, if developing kids and, and, um, and then making the jump to a bigger club is what they see fit. Then, then that happens, you know, that's happened hundreds of times in the 10 years, you know, where yeah. we've had players leave our club and, and go to the top team. And, and, um, we're, we're okay with that. You know, we are not a feeder program. We don't push kids out the back door by any means, but you know, I had a goalie tie rinker that I had for three or four seasons and, and he made the jump to SDSC surf for six months and now he's a real Salt Lake Academy kid. And, and we knew he had that in him from 11 or 12 years old. And so those are success stories that another club might get a little bit of credit for. Um, but, but the rinkers know, you know, where the developmental curve happened and, right. and, and Ty knows where, you know, he was really looked after as well. And so, you know, it, we, we like being on the field. We like hanging out with the kids. It, it's honestly a, a, the most enjoyable part of, of the um of the job you know and in over the last 10 years i've had board members you know ask me to take less teams uh and just take one team and direct the club and and facilitate this and do that and i'm like dude i i i, I do this to get on the field with the kids and coach yeah. the kids and go into battle with the kids you know we're, we're in the man city final yesterday and you know i'm like thinking dude sub me in get me on this field i, I want it i wanted it as much right. as they wanted it and and yeah. it translates in into those players and so you know we we love being on the field with the kids and and that's why we're doing it you know um i would love to hear kind of your your thoughts of like why why community clubs are in a, a vital component of the ecosystem for the, the health of the game in our country um, because I think that a lot of people 
um, look down upon a community club. A lot of people, even if, even if you are like, let's, let's say for sake of argument, Craig, you are a feeder club, like sake of argument. That is not a bad thing. It is actually like one of the healthiest parts of like us growing as a better soccer country. So, and I'm not saying Cardiff is, although there's a, there's a big element historically that that has been what it has been because it focuses and has done such a good job stewarding development for players rather than just polishing diamonds. Like that, that's a different yeah. conversation, right? So, so talk to me a little bit about like the need for community-based like clubs for the health of the overall ecosystem in our country. You know, it, it's tricky because over the last five years, I'd say the landscape is definitely evolving and you're finding a lot of mergers and you're finding a lot of affiliations. And, you know, you, you look at the amount of surf and city and Albion clubs in the city and, and it might now be 40% of, of all of the clubs in the city, which historically was not the case. When I grew up, you played in your backyard until you outgrew your backyard and then you went to the big pond. And now, right. you know, you, you jump to the big pond at six years old because you're afraid you're going to lose developmental curve or whatever. And the truth is it's really about the coaching um, and, and, and being developed in the right manner as a youth player. And so the struggles of a community-based club are um, the administrative elements the running the website, the running the social media, the marketing pieces and the flyers, those are very difficult to do from a small club end. As I said, I have all volunteer right. board members. Everybody has big jobs. I mean, historically, there have been writers and lawyers and scientists and all the above that are working day in and day out and then doing right. a lot of this stuff um, in, their, in their free time. And so, right. you know, for example, if, if I – became Cardiff Albion, immediately Albion starts to run my website, runs my social right. media, takes over my flyers, takes and it pulls, you know, 30% of the work off of my plate. And and I'm sure it would be really easy to do, but I'm also sure I would lose a lot of my um, ability to dictate the direction of the yeah. club, which is something that I'm not going to give up. And, and I've sat in dozens of affiliation meetings in, in, ended the meetings and looked at him and been like, wait, what do I get again? What right. you're going to run my website? Right. Like she yeah. runs the website and she does a great job. And for now I, I don't need that. And so yeah, I can walk around the field tonight, this afternoon when I go out there and I will know 75% of the players on that field, first and last name. And I will greet everybody that walks across that field. And uh, I can tell you the tendencies of 50% of my players and how they play and what foot they are and what the what they need to work on and what they don't need to work on. And, and the truth is you're never going to find that at a big club. You're going to be a, uh, you know, you have to be on the elite elite level type group to, to have a little bit of face or recognition over there. And, and, you know, I'm covering boys, 14 white followed by, you know, the, the U 19 group. And, and um, we've really built a good club culture uh, over there of, Teams supporting teams, coaches supporting coaches. You know, yesterday at, at our, our Manchester City Cup final, we had four coaches on the sideline and we had 15, you know, 2015s and, and 14s watching the, the older boys play. And, and um, you know, the, those are the special moments, you know, that a community-based club um, can have. And, and um, it's unfortunate to see so many of them merging and, and, and losing, um, their hold a little bit in, in the community they've been in. I mean, you look at Hotspurs, I think the Hotspurs had been a club for 45 years, 50 years. And, and, uh, you know, and now they're part of sporting and, and SD United is now part of Albion. And I mean, the list goes on and on and yeah. on. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure for them, it's it's a jersey change and a little bit of, of work taken off their plate. And still administratively, a lot of it is similar, hopefully, for those community-based clubs. But they're an important part of the totem pole. They're an important part of the um, of the ecosystem in the process. And, um, and you know, I, I'm going to stand strong. And, and our affiliation with the Soccers was about as as good of a balance as I can do where – you know, we picked up a little bit of name power with the San Diego Soccers. Um, 
and we didn't lose any control of, of our club whatsoever. You know, we, we, we use their name, you know, they help us get on the turn uh, tournament day. You know, we help um, sell tickets to their games when possible. It, it's a fantastic affiliation and relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were still able to completely maintain our club Autonomy. culture and yeah. identity. Yep. Yeah. Which is super important, which, yeah, again, we, we've got like five podcasts we could have from this one about like the, you know, it's the Space Wars, man. It's Coke and Pepsi. Uh, not, yeah. And that's not just a Southern California thing. You know, there's like, you know, Colorado Rush and like all the clubs that they have all over the country. You know, there's there's the Crossfires. I mean, there's there's so many of these huge clubs where they've seen this at, in, a, in an ability to maintain power and maintain control. They're creating their own ecosystems. <clears throat> which it, under the guise that, Hey, this helps the pathway better when in essence, what it doesn't, it just, it dilutes um, the ability for us, the average person to be able to contribute to it in a more meaningful way. Uh, unless you have like, you know, an absolute elite freak athlete. Um, you're turning the page a little bit now and kind of hitting into our descent and our conversation, Craig, I kind of want to talk uh, uh, two quick things. Um, one that for you, um, what are the mountains like on, on the horizon for you, like to climb at this stage in your, in your playing career and your, in your coaching career? Like what, what are you still seeing as being like the two mountains like left for you to climb that are out there still? Yeah. You, you know, it's crazy when you get yourself into 10 plus professional years, you start to realize that your role has to evolve. And, and I've watched a lot of players not evolve their role and been pushed out the back door. And, and if you think you're going to have the same responsibility or ability as a player, um, you know, that you did in your first couple of years, in your last couple of years, you're mistaken. And so yeah. uh, I've evolved as a player. I've taken more of a leadership role within the locker room. I, I, I in theory, play less minutes and I play a little bit more influential minutes in terms of free kicks and power plays and offensive shifts that benefit our, our team. Um, And so, you know, as a player, whether you're, you're going from club to high school or from high school to college or college to the pros, you know, you've got to evolve as a player. You've got to get better. You've, you've got to um, adapt uh, to the circumstances and, uh, and that's something I'm proud of doing. And that's something that I've watched a lot of players not do well enough and cost them a lot. You know, I've seen you 16 national team players show up to a collegiate program and within one month are a shell of the player they were for, for 10 years because of, of the situation that they're in. And so changing, adapting, evolving, understanding the circumstances and situation around you um, is critical to, to, you know, continuing your career. And and the motivating factor I have right now is my seven-year-old boys and my eight-year-old daughter that come to every single game. And, and, you know, Brady wants to be a goalie because of Boris Pardo, the goalie of the year who killed it. And, and, you know, they, they come on the field every game, they come through the bubble, they, they practice, they show up with practice with me all the time. And, and um, they're at the point in their life now where they can actually recognize and understand what's happening. And, and it, with every year, they gain a little bit more understanding and insight, you know, and, um, and it's really fun to watch. And it, it's something that, that has revamped my motivation to continue to play, uh, yeah. even if it's a lesser role for the team. Um, and so, you know, uh, um, I'm looking forward to the next couple of years, uh, barring no catastrophic injuries, you know, I, I should be able to continue to um, add something to the squad. And, and this year I, I had a, you know, on paper, a fantastic year. And, and, um, and, and it was a really fun year in general, winning the championship was the cherry on top of the cake, but it was a fantastic group. And, and, um, and it was a great locker room to be part of and something that I'll always cherish and and uh i think down the road um you know i'll be looking to put my name in the hat to be the san diego soccer's head coach at some point and and um i don't think that's far-fetched and and i don't think there are many people locally or nationally that understand the indoor game um as well as i do you know i spent nine years with the u.s futsal national team 35 plus caps in in 10 different countries and so 
you know, that's where you cut your teeth a little bit too. And, and, and those were very educational, you know, crash courses to the small sided game that, that I'll have with me, you know, for a long time. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I'm doing right now is, is I'm mentoring some of these U18, 19 players that, that aren't college bound um, into playing for the soccer's reserve team with the intention to get a couple of them into the first team and get some more local players into the San Diego soccer's organization, because uh, you look around the group and and you've got myself and you've got Xavier, who's a, um, an Oceanside product and, and he was the backup goalkeeper Um but, you know, the rest of the well-established players are, are from TJ. They're from Mexico City. They're from um, Brazil uh, and, and the rest of the country. And so it's like if I can help um, develop a youth player and do the first team, you know, that would be the, the, right. the goal for the next month or two. And I, I had Jesse Gonzalez, one of my U19 players, who's still playing with the club, um, participate in 10 uh, M2 games last year and play with the big pros in the reserve league and, and win a national championship with our soccer two team. And he didn't play as many minutes as he wished he would have played, but I, I'm sure he's a better player for it. And I'm sure he learned a lot about right. the business and, and, you know, and, and how to go about operating as a 17 year old amongst 25 year old pros. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the, uh, that's the next step. Can I get some of these Cardiff kids in into the soccer's reserve team? And, and can I get a couple of those reserve team players to sign a first team contract and, and, uh, and fulfill their goals and, and down the road when my playing career is over, um, you know, potentially take over the first team at some point if, uh, if that's what's on the, um, on the table. I, I think that's wonderful. I mean, it's, it kind of shows just the, the viability of the pathway there. And I think that that's, what's really cool. And, and man, one of the things I appreciate is just your dedication to the community and to keep it, um, you know, to keep it community focused, uh, the, you know, thinking of your own backyard first, um, that there's an, I mean, granted we're in San Diego, this is literally like one of the most fertile soils, <laughs> soccer, soccer, you know, soccering foils, uh, or soils in the country. So it's, we're not, we're not hurting for talent in the County, so to speak, but not every place in the country is like that. Um, Craig, one last question, you know, as we kind of wrap it up here, I want to, um, we always ask this question on the show and, uh, you're, you're given the ability to enact one sweeping measure, uh, one wish, if you will, one rub of the lamp, one wave of the wand, and you can make one thing happen in the the country uh, in regards to soccer uh, with sweeping in full effect, immediate. What would you change and what effect would that have on the growth of the game in our country? I, th- I think that uh, U.S. soccer is so fragmented, it, it's hard to even understand from an outside perspective. And, uh, and I think that if the youth soccer landscape could could unite as one similar to England and a lot of the other places where there are tiers to work up and, and there is um, – and everybody is included in the, in the tiers, I, I think it would be beneficial. Right now there are 10 different leagues and, and all 10 different leagues are run by different people who are looking out for their best interest yeah. and, and there's a – um, you know, uh, an old boys club of getting into this league and they're blocking out that person and they're blocking out that person, not for the betterment of the kids. And so, you know, if, if the country could have a promotion relegation, you know, similar to youth soccer where there is, you know, there is a top entity and then it trickles down and we're all on the same um, wavelength. I, I really think it would, it would, you know, benefit all of the players and it would be less fractioned and it would be hard. It would be easier for everybody to follow, you know, right now, everybody's disclosing their league and their name with a gold or an elite tag. It's like ECNL gold two level premier, you know, and it's confusing to everybody. Nobody knows what, what is happening. And it's like, hold on that. It should be flight one through flight four or five. And, and, you know, you, you go up and you go down in those groups. And, and if you're in flight one, you know, it, it's ECNL and MLS next quality. 
but it's just it's just labeled different. You don't need ECNL here and MLS next there and GA there and EA there and and you you know the list goes on and on. It's dozens right. and dozens of acronyms that are just confusing to the general soccer parent and uh, not what's best for the kid. Um, but it's really clubs looking at what's best for them. We're in this league. We're going to sell this league. We're going to crap on the other league. So you think this is the best league to be in. Um, and, and we're going to get all the college coaches to come look at these couple leagues so we can pull all the best players over there. And, and the truth is I show up to those college showcases and I walk up to those college coaches and I tell them, you've seen every ECNL player. I know you've been to 14 MLS next showcases. I've got untapped talent that you haven't seen. And I've got diamonds in the rough that are elite, elite level players that have the ability to play college soccer if I can get them the exposure and the right eyes on them. And right there, 50% of them are like, you're talking our language. We know what's in those pools. We know what's in the ECNL pool. We have seen the MLS next pool three, four different times over. We're looking for, you know, that diamond in the rough quality that we can bring into our program and mentor and, and take over. And so, you know, I'm doing a different sales pitch because that's what I have to do. But the truth is right. it, it should be the best players should play in the best brackets and, and clubs shouldn't be excluded from that. And clubs should, you know, everybody should be included. If you've got a 2013 girls team that you've put together, that is an absolute barn burner, you should be able to put them in the top league and it shouldn't be able to you know, no, well, you've got to establish under another club or do this and that. And so, you know, I, I just think if, if it could be more united, from the federation down, yeah. um, it, it would really benefit youth soccer in general. Yeah. I mean, it's gosh, uh, again, podcast number six that we can have Craig, um, maybe just make you co-host of the show and we'll just go that route. But, um, the federation needs to act like a federation and instead of acting, acting like the marketing organizing arm to sell more merchandise and to get us to go to national team games, they actually need to lead and to show leadership that, there are there are business practices within the game that cannot be tolerated because it's not to the benefit of the whole of the game in the ecosystem. Whether you come from the hood or the suburbs, <clears throat> everybody wears the same amount of cleats. Everybody's got to wear the same uniform and you just step on the field and let your game speak for itself. And that has to happen. Like at some point it has to happen. Very similar to like the reset that like the German Federation had to had to take over and to reset for their whole health of their program. So, well, <clears throat> Craig, let's get Marissa back here uh, on the show. Love to get her thoughts as we kind of wrap up here. Marissa, what'd you think? Uh, you know, I, I love hearing the backstory. One of the things that I wrote down um, was that, um, like, seeing how it affects your children and how you want to, like, it, it renews your ability to continue on. And I think... Um, having someone like you in a leadership position in San Diego is, you know, going to affect not only your children, but all the other people that see you when they go to uh, watch a soccer match or even your coaches. Like I know um, one of your coaches personally, and he, uh, Mikey, I don't know if you know who yeah. that is, um, yeah. but he talks very highly of you just in our personal conversation. So I know that you're making an impact um, in many ways, if he, if he hasn't told you already. So, um, I think we need that, um, you know, just in general, uh, to help grow the game. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here as soccer geeks. So hopefully. Yeah. Cool. yeah well, why don't you there. let our <laughs> listeners know, Marissa, how everybody can get involved by following our chiseled chin, yeah. Mount Rushmore-esque <laughs> Craig Faust. <laughs> yeah, uh, Craig Childs on Instagram, uh, Craig Childs 37 on Instagram, and Craig Childs on Twitter. Should be not too hard to find Craig with a K. Um, him, uh, Craig yes, with K. exactly. Yeah. I should make, make that clear. It'll be yeah. in the notes too, but uh, if you're watching, you can see it on the screen. So, Craig, thanks so much for being a guest on our show today and for sharing your not only your experience, but also your wisdom and your passion for the game. Uh, you know, you're always welcome anytime on the show. Um, thanks so much for what you're doing to grow the game in this country. And uh, we wish you absolutely all the best. You got it. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks, buddy. Enjoy Thank your day. You. Bye.